favorite subjects, which is the Pre-Raphaelites. So I want to tell you a little bit about who they are or who they were and what they were about. Um, so the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was founded in 1848 by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, William Holman Hunt, and John Everett Millay, all of who appear in the novel. So Louis Frost was actually a fictional member um, that the author created for her own purposes, but he portrays many of the characteristics that the real life members had, such as his devil may care attitude and his romance with his model. So all three original members were young men in their early 20s studying at the Royal Academy. And so the Royal Academy was the leading art institute in the Victorian era. And they decided what constituted as good art and what constituted as bad art. And the three men rebelled against the teachings of the academy, especially the belief that art must sometimes deviate from truth to capture beauty. So as Louis says in the novel, they wanted to show Jesus with dirty feet and Joseph with a wart on his chin. So they wanted to show a more realistic, less idolized perspective, uh, which Ira challenges in the novel and which I want to talk about with you all today of if these paintings that we're seeing are actually you know, a depiction of reality, or if we see them as being idolized. So not long after all this, um, the three men left the academy, and thus the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood was formed. So the name Pre-Raphaelites came from their desire to revive the medieval themes and techniques that were prevalent during the time before Raphael, so pre-15th century. There was a revival of medievalism during the Victorian era, and the Pre-Raphaelites wanted their art to possess the intense detail, vibrant colors, and focus on reality that medieval art exhibited. The Pre-Raphaelites originally focused on religious subject matter, but evolved to influences from poetry such as Shakespeare, John Keats, and Alfred Lord Tennyson. They received much criticism, as we see in the novel, and um, especially from Royal Academy President Joshua Reynolds and the famous novelist Charles Dickens. But the Pre-Raphaelites were fortunate to find a devoted patron in the art critic John Ruskin, who you all may remember from the James Whistler exhibit. So Ruskin famously told Whistler that his painting Nocturne in Black and Gold was like flinging a pot of paint into the public's face. And Whistler sued him for libel for that. So this is the man that, although he didn't like Whistler's paintings, he was an avid supporter of the Pre-Raphaelites. So the Pre-Raphaelites exhibited at the Royal Academy's summer exhibition as they do in the novel. And their following steadily grew and their influence spread to include sculpture, interior design and mural painting. So even though the original brotherhood disbanded after a few years, their influence stretched throughout the rest of the 19th century. So I want to show you all some of the Pre-Raphaelites' most famous paintings, just so that you can get a sense of what they were trying to accomplish, but also because they're just incredibly beautiful works of art that I think everyone should have a look at. So to start, this is The Awakening Conscience by William Holman Hunt. And what the story is of this painting is it is a kept woman who is having this moment of realization that she is living in sin. And so this is a theme that was really popular with the Pre-Raphaelites and they loved sort of showing the fallen women and um, how this is portrayed to us is it's really difficult to see, but the way her left hand is clasped, it shows that there are rings on every finger except for her ring finger. So showing that she is not married to this man. And I'm, I know it's really difficult to see, but that is what that is showing us is that she is this man's mistress, um, that they are not married. And then as well down in the left corner, you can see a cat playing with a dead bird, sort of that idea of being a plaything, of being trapped in this life, which is what this woman is. But then, of course, from the novel's perspective, it's fun to imagine if the dead bird is, you know, one of Silas's creations that Hunt used um, as a prop. But then as well, this painting is really hopeful because you can see behind the woman, there is a mirror reflecting the open window or the open door, showing that she is looking out into the world beyond this life of sin and that she will leave and begin her life anew. 
So that was a big thing that the Pre-Raphaelites were really interested in was this idea of redemption, of sin, and of good versus evil, themes like that. So then another painting that we have is The Scapegoat by William Holman Hunt. And Margo told me this is one of her favorite ones. Again, so William Holman Hunt had a crisis of religious faith and he traveled to the Holy Land and began this painting on the shores of the Dead Sea. And he finished it up while he was in London. And again, it deals with those themes of sin because the scapegoat comes from the Old Testament in the Bible where the village would tie the red, the red, you know, ribbon that's around the goat's horns to represent the village's sin and then cast the goat out into the wilderness to die. So, you know, driving that sin away, that was, you know, they were really, they were really about that sort of being free from <laughs> sin and um, leaving that life behind. So then this painting is um, called The Annunciation by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. I'm not going to attempt the Latin name because that wouldn't go very well um, for anyone. But I wanted to show you all this painting because this painting shows why the Pre-Raphaelites were considered controversial. Because for me, I tend to look at these paintings and I see them as really beautiful works of art and I don't really see them as offensive or upsetting. But when this painting premiered, it was considered very controversial and very offensive. So what this painting is showing is the angel Gabriel appearing to the Virgin Mary, telling her that she is going to give birth to the child of God. And so normally um, when this painting would be done or the scene depicted, it would be one of uh, like a very pious gift where Mary is very humbled and very grateful. But instead, it's showing us a scene of a grown man appearing in the bedroom of a young woman who is in her nightdress and is cowering away on her bed, away from this man who we can see is naked because of the way his robe is open down the side. We can see his form. And so instead of depicting the scene as one of religious piety, it's one of intrusion and violation. And the critics did not like that. And it was considered very offensive and, you know, sort of, you know, not a great take on the religious texts. And, you know, as I said earlier, Louis says in the book that they wanted to show that side of religion, especially with, um, you know, Jesus with dirty feet and the scene of, you know, intrusion instead of religious celebration. I, I was just going to ask a question. Yeah. Um, what what is that in the foreground, um, Amanda? What is that um, red um, <clears throat> towel? It looks like a towel has been placed over something. Do you know what that is? I'm not sure, but it looks like lilies are draped over it, which is what Gabriel is holding in his hand. It looks like maybe uh. lilies. But I remember studying as well the sharp contrast between like the blue and the red, considering the rest of the scene is very white and how Mary is usually depicted wearing that blue that is behind her. But instead, it's sort of that jarring contrast, I think is what Rossetti was trying to show us. And there's probably a deeper meaning as well, but I don't remember what that might be, so. Okay, thank you. I was just curious what that might be. Yeah, of course. Um, and then, so this is another one of Rossetti's. This is Proserpine, which is the Roman version of the goddess Persephone. And so this is just a beautiful woman um, that the Pre-Raphaelites love to depict. So the model was Jane Morris, and she was actually married to William Morris, who was an artist later influenced by the Pre-Raphaelites. And she and Rossetti were actually having a love affair at the time this painting was done. So the painting is depicting a forbidden woman, and then that was actually the case with um, Rossetti and Jane. They were having an affair. Um, as you learn more about the Pre-Raphaelites, you will learn that pretty much all of them were romantically intertwined somehow or another with one another. <laughs> so <laughs> it's definitely, it's it's a fun rabbit hole to go down for sure. And then I have La Ghirlandata mm. by Rossetti. And I just, I love this painting. I just think it's so beautiful. And again, it's the idealized woman with the red hair and the thick lips and the pale skin. And it's a very angelic setting. And I just want to stare at it for hours and I just want to be in this world, whatever it may be. I just think it's so beautiful. 
want to keep looking at that. Um, did did they use oils? Is that what they used oils on on canvas? Is that a stupid question? Um, I believe so. I don't remember with this one, but they tended to use oil on canvas. That tended to be their go-to medium. It's just so beautiful. I agree with you. I just think it's beautiful. Yeah, it re- it really is. And you know, again, with what I mentioned earlier, with sort of the idealized you know, version of the female form where, you know, I don't know many women who look like this, um, but, you know, the pre-Raphaelites, you know, in the novel discuss how they wanted to show a more realistic perspective, but I don't, I don't know how realistic this is. Maybe (laughs) it's more true to other people's experiences than my own, but. I look just like this. (laughs) (laughs) I love the eye color. I love their (laughs) eyes. Mm -hmm. They're very beautiful. And then the next one I want to show you all, this is Beata Beatrix, which is Rossetti's posthumous portrait of his wife, Lizzie, who died when she was in her 30s. She died very young. Um, And I don't want to dwell on this too much because we're actually going to talk about um, Lizzie more in a moment. But I just wanted to show you all this painting because it is one of Rossetti's uh, more well-known ones. And then uh, there's John Everett Millay, who also appears in the novel, sort of um, nipping at Louis' heels in quite a a few of the scenes. But this painting is actually discussed in the novel. It's um, the one Millay submits to the summer exhibition at the same time that Louis submits his painting of Wigmar's Queen. So what I wanted to draw your all's attention to with this painting is that It is also a story of imprisonment. So you have Mariana, who is imprisoned in this tower. The quote with this painting is actually, my life is dreary, he cometh not, which is quoted so often in the novel. And that comes from a Tennyson poem, which was inspired by Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. It tells the story of a woman who is imprisoned, but I personally think this imprisonment looks fantastic. Like she has a nice window with a beautiful stained glass. (laughs) It's a comfortable chair, a beautiful dress, and, you know, she can stand and stretch, and, you know, she has a candle in the background. You know, it's quite And the mouse. And the mouse, (laughs) which, you know, is actually mentioned in the book where um, that's the mouse that Malay gets from Silas that um, Louis sort of urges him, you know, put something in that corner to give it a little bit of movement. Um. But I just want to compare this to Iris's imprisonment and how that seems much more realistic and (laughs) horrifying of being tied to a chair in a dark, dank cellar. She's going to the bathroom where she's sitting. You know, it just, I think this painting looks much more preferable in terms of imprisonment. Like if I was going to be imprisoned, this is how I would want it to be (laughs) instead of Iris's version. So I don't know if you all feel the same way, but that is, that is how I feel about this. Uh, Yeah. and then um, Ophelia, which is arguably the most famous of the Pre-Raphaelite paintings. Wow. I just think it is absolutely stunning. It's so beautiful. And of course, Ophelia comes from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, Ophelia commits suicide um, after Hamlet goes mad. And the model is Lizzie Settle, who I mentioned earlier. And she was Rossetti's wife. Um although they weren't married at the time of this painting. And it's actually discussed in the novel at the dinner scene. Um, They're discussing how Malay will paint um, Lizzie as Ophelia. And the story behind that is that Lizzie actually had to lay in the bathtub for several hours while Malay painted her. And he heated the water with oil lamps. But at one point, the lamps went out and the water turned icy but Malay didn't notice and Lizzie didn't say anything. And she actually caught a cold and got very sick. Lizzie's father threatened to sue Malay, but he appeased him by paying for her medical bills. So that's the story behind this painting is, you know, is like Ophelia, Lizzie had to pay a little bit of a price um, for, you know, a man's ambition. But mm. then I want, I want to talk about Lizzie. So I want to talk about Elizabeth Siddle. So in the last 50 years, there has been a shift of focus onto the women associated with the, with the pre-Raphaelite movement. And they are called the pre-Raphaelite sisterhood, which is a term coined by Jan Marsh in 1985. So like Iris and the Doll Factory, many of the women were both models and artists. 
And as I said, the one I want to talk about today is Elizabeth Siddle, who is the beautiful face in so many of the pre-Raphaelite paintings. And she appears briefly in the novel, as I said, at the dinner party, and they discuss Malay painting her as Ophelia. And I believe that Iris is loosely based on Elizabeth Siddle, actually. So like Iris, the legend has it that Lizzie was discovered by the pre-Raphaelites while she was working in a shop. But in Lizzie's case, it was a milliner's shop, not a doll shop. And Lizzie was considered quite plain, which the pre-Raphaelites thought would be perfect for their paintings. Same with sort of Iris, how she has the twisted collarbone. They sort of sought after sort of women that weren't the idolized beauty, even though they then created them into an idolized beauty in their paintings. Um, so as the novel discusses, modeling was con not considered respectable since it involved being alone with a man for many hours. However, like Iris, Lizzie saw this as an opportunity for mobility, and she began studying under Rossetti, and eventually John Ruskin became her patron. So the man that all the pre-Raphaelites wanted um, to be their patron actually became Lizzie's patron instead. So like Iris, Lizzie challenged the idealized women in the pre-Raphaelite paintings, and while the men often depicted the women tragically sacrificing themselves for love, Lizzie painted women in their moment of action or choice. She often showed the woman's side of the story as opposed to the woman through the male gaze. She showed a more realistic female perspective. And even though her art is more rudimentary in skill than her male counterparts, it undoubtedly shows an important side of the story. And so for comparison, I wanna show you all these two paintings um, depicting the Lady of Shalott. So The Lady of Shalott is a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, and it tells the story of a woman imprisoned in a tower on an island overlooking Camelot. So she must sit all, at her loom all day and weave without stopping, for if she does, a curse will come upon her. When she glimpses Sir Lancelot from her window, she pauses her work to look, thus bringing about the curse. She leaves her tower and sails across the water on a boat, her house, a later um, artist influenced by the pre-Raphaelites. And then the painting on the right is um, by Elizabeth Siddle. So I wanted to ask you all what you observed about these paintings. What, what, how do you respond to them? How do you react? What do you all think? Do we know what the curse was? Uh, it was death. So oh. she she oh. dies. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So if she was like going to go blind or something like that. No, that would be that would probably be too nice. No, she <laughs> um she is sailing across the water in the painting on the left, and she dies before she reaches shore. So she never actually makes it to Camelot. Mm -hmm. So I see that that um, Lizzie is working. She's mm -hmm. doing something. Right. <clears throat> like right. women do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. As Margot said, you know, Lizzie's drawing, it shows, it shows her in the moment of, of choice, of action, where she's been working at her loom, and then she looks away, and she makes that choice to look out the window to see Sir Lancelot and the world beyond. So it is showing her in the moment of choice, as opposed to the Waterhouse painting, which shows her on the way to die, where she has made the choice, she is on the boat, and there's nothing left for her to do but die, which is quite tragic. So, yeah. mm -hmm. anything else you all observe about these paintings or these works of art? What's the little thing on the edge of the stool that she's sitting on? It looks like, yeah, right there. Okay. Um, I don't know. It, it looks like a scary creature. Yeah, I kind of like see that. It looks like a carving, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It could be. I haven't noticed that before, but it looks like it could be some kind of carving into the edge of her stool. You know, if if she did put those sort of subtle symbols in her drawing, which was very common, you know, on the other hand of that with water houses, you have that beautiful quilt that is draped over the side of the boat mm. that has... Um, the scenes of courtly love in the little circles. And so it tells that story too, which, as I mentioned, the pre-Raphaelites love their symbolism. Are those candles in the boat? They are, yes. Because and it, it, looks, it, it looks like it's the wrong time of day for candles. <laughs> it does, it does, doesn't it? And it looks like two of them are blown out and one of them seems to be quivering in the wind. Right. So 
that could be representing how her candle is about to blow out about how her life is about to be snuffed because you're right. It's, it's much too bright for that to really provide any kind of light that isn't already there. Anyone else um, have any observations about the paintings, the works of art? I gotta say, I loved these as a child. They were always stuffed into books of poetry and mythology and they told a story and so you could just stare at them while you were being read to or reading Mm -hmm. I just they were they were riveting I gotta say more than kind of the more two-dimensional medieval art um and there was always a story yeah, I agree with that, definitely. And especially because so many of their paintings came from poetry, came from, you know, medieval tales and legends, that there is always a story there. There's always so much more than what's being shown. There's so many layers to it. But thank you for that. That's really interesting. The conclusion that I wanted, um, that I draw from these two um, works of art side by side is that even though we may aesthetically prefer the one on the left, because I I certainly do. I think the one on the left, the Waterhouse painting, I think it's one of the most beautiful works of art I've ever seen. I just absolutely mm-hmm. adore it. And I think that's okay. You know, that's that's all right. But while we may prefer that one, I think Lizzie's painting does show, or her drawing shows such a crucial side of the story, even though the skill is much simpler you know it's not as detailed it's not as vibrant it doesn't draw you in as much but it shows um the lady not as a tragic victim but as a woman who has been imprisoned all her life finally taking action and making a choice and this is what the novel shows us so while iris hopes that louis will come and rescue her at the end of the day she must take action and save herself and that is exactly what she does and that's the only way she escapes. Right. And um, at the end of the audiobook, Margot and I were discussing this. Um, the interviewer asks the author, there's an interview at the end, and she says, you know, had you always planned on Iris saving herself? And the author says, I would rather have had her die in that cellar than have somebody else rescue her. I'd rather her, you know, her rescue. <laughs> I guess she did. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. But that's all I have. So uh, thank you all so much. I appreciate it.